This is London. You will now hear a statement by the Prime Minister. I am speaking to you in the Cabinet Room. I didn't really think much about the war until uh, Chamberlain said that Hitler had not replied to our ultimatum, so consequently we were at war with Germany. And I felt a terrible foreboding because I kept worrying will mum and dad be killed. This morning, the British ambassador in Berlin handed the German government a final note stating that unless we heard from them by 11 o'clock, that they were prepared at once to withdraw their troops from Poland, a state of war. It was a Sunday morning and we were at home and we waited to hear the announcement that war was declared on the wireless. Mr Chamberlain came on and said that we were now at war with the Germans. I have to tell you now that no such undertaking has been received and that consequently this country is at war. And Dad and I walked up the road to see if anything was happening and we didn't see any terrific happenings so we went back and my sister came downstairs she was about 11 with her gas mask and her earplugs in and she obviously thought that she had to stay like that till the end of the war carry your gas mask with you always all cinemas theaters and other places of entertainment are to be closed immediately until further notice that is the end of these announcements I actually believed that there would be people on horseback galloping down the streets and rescuing people and all sorts of nonsense. And we had the false war where there were people going around being very authoritarian and shouting about closing blackouts. There was a sort of the issue of gas masks and everybody walked around with them. Each road had their own shelters delivered. They were dumped in the back garden. Nuts and bolts were in a bag with a spanner with instructions. What happened was that you dug a hole in your garden, four or six feet deep, and you stuck this thing in there, and then uh, you bolted it together, and then you covered the top with earth. That wasn't enough for many of the people down the road. Being very English, they decided to turf the top, and others would grow flowers. But they were all very idiosyncratic. They were painted, and some of them polished the handles. It was just incredible. These things were very territorial, and you would no more think of going down anybody else's shelter than you would of going in anybody else's house. Remember the very first air raid, and like many thousands of other people, we ended up under the stairs with the insurance policy, thinking that was the very safest place to be. That was the first time that I knew that there was a war on, a real war on. I grew up from being a boy to a young man, knowing that I wasn't indestructible. The excitement was building. It was almost like an overture to a Wagnerian opera. The adrenaline was running. I stand at the head of a government representing all parties in the state, all creeds, all classes, every recognizable section of opinion. We are ranged beneath the crown of our ancient monarchy. We are supported by a free parliament and a free press. But there is one bond which unites us all and sustains us in the public regard, namely, and it is increasingly becoming known that we are prepared to proceed to all extremities, to endure them and to enforce them. That is our bond of union in His Majesty's government tonight. The air raid sirens went. We went to the shelter. We were a typical terraced house with the Anderson shelter at the bottom of a 30-yard garden. And the next door shelter would be 10 yards to the left and the other side would be 10 yards to the right. Now the old lady on our right refused to go down the shelter. She was almost blind and she was old and she said if she was going to die, she was going to die in her own house, in her own bed. She just simply refused to use the shelter. On the other side was a family, our neighbours and friends. Now this particular night there was a number of air raids and four landmines straddled the road completely demolishing the whole of the road. Now, I distinctly remember being in the shelter, hearing a rush of wind, 
followed by this noise that was the most deafening, frightening noise I'd ever heard in my life, followed by a sensation of the whole of your body being compressed in. The air was pushed out and this hot, sticky feeling in there. My father had been on the back wall outside of the house and the whole wall had collapsed on him and that was what saved his life. The shelter itself had crumpled and bent, but basically had withstood the blast. And we came out of the shelter and there was no street left, it was demolished. The next door shelter with a family in appeared to be okay. It stood and the other side, the house where the old lady lived, that had been completely demolished and there were some fires going on there. My father rushed to the next door, the family, and found them all to be dead. The blast had killed the whole the family down there. We walked down the road and we could see the utter desolation. The whole of the road was just completely destroyed. And at the bottom of the road, there was a bridge. As we were going across, bombs were dropping and the incendiary bombs were peppering the bridge. The whole thing was like a fireworks display. It was orange. You could see aircraft in the sky. You could see barrage balloons up. You could see searchlights. It was almost a sonne lumiere of death. I'm standing on top of a very tall building from where I can see practically the whole of London spread round me. And if this weren't so appalling, I think it would be one of the most wonderful sights I've ever seen. The whole of the skyline to the south is lit up with a ruddy glow, almost like a sunrise or a sunset, with white fleecy clouds and a bright orange light behind. But one knows quite well that it is neither of those, because to the right, to the southeast, there are leaping flames which silhouette very plainly the spires of a small church. And I think the most beautiful sight of all, apart from the tragedy of it, are the towers and the suspension bridge of the tower bridge, which stand out very clearly against the light. There's another fire more to the east, which is leaping up and the flames are leaping up in the air now. St. Paul, the dome of St. Paul's Cathedral is silhouetted blackly against it and one or two of the smaller city churches to the east of that. Then there's a space of comparative darkness except for the reflection from the sky and we come to another red patch further east this time and I should say some four or five miles away from us. The smoke is going up very slowly and it's just illuminated faintly. I started nursing uh, in Bolton and uh, f from there I went to the Royal London Hospital. Before the German raids took place with the high explosive bombs, they would come over and drop their incendiary bombs and put places on fire and mark their targets. It was absolutely essential that you acted as quickly as possible to put the fires out. And, uh, and that's what we, you know, we were taught how to use stirrup pumps and deal with those sort of emergencies. And uh, we often had to carry on nursing wearing tin hats. Um, there was almost a kind of cycle with these raids. At the height of the bombing, first of all, the air raid siren, siren used to go. So we, we were aware of that. And then we used to hear the planes, and we had one of these huge anti-aircraft guns right near the hospital, which, uh, you know, more or less made the place rock. But, I mean, it, it had got to be there, and because you could see the searchlights were always there, crossing and crossing and picking out the planes. And we were accustomed to seeing the Spitfires going out, and that was a relief. And the, the night that we were hit, there were 14, I think, hospitals hit that night. We weren't the only one, but Thomas's guys. We had, we had all the equipment ready, and the, the wards were, were made ready, and uh, our training had taught us what 
uh, you know, what to expect. And we had um, rooms ready for the moribund patients and so on. And um, the oxygen was laid on tap, of course. And it was a case of, of a lot of people with burns in particular from these incendiary bombs extensive burns it was terrible to see them i think that was the most painful part of seeing youngsters i mean a lot of the children have been evacuated but i can remember various teenage boys and girls being brought in with these terrible burns they were so brave and they were under such pressure they were on the front line of this war as they were in a lot of the other cities I can remember one boy in particular, I think he was about 17 and his name was Jimmy and he was oh, he was burnt from head to foot and I can remember we got him onto the bed and I, I was dealing with his um, burns and strip dressing so you're only exposed a little bit at a time and all he could say was, oh give me a tizer. It's almost like the day of judgment pictured in some of the old books and right out on the horizon now to the south there are two little twinkling red dots I'd say those two were fires which had been started during the late afternoon raid but they're only twinkling fitfully and it's difficult from here to assess them at anything like their true magnitude the sky is lit up all right, I suppose, for up to a thousand feet for this red glow, and it doesn't show any signs of diminishing. In fact, I should say now that the flames are leaping even higher, and of course it's not helped by the fact that there's a strong breeze blowing. One very notable thing is the flights of birds which keep on wheeling over our heads whether they were disturbed earlier in the day by the noise of the planes or the bombs, I don't know. But they're restless and there's no homing place for them. Well, it's from the shelters that you're going to hear first, and you're down on the platform. Right, right at the end of the very long platform here. Right at the end of the very long platform. And the train just come in, a train on its way up towards Cockfosters. They've just had it dropped then. And the platforms themselves are absolutely crowded as though it was a cup final. But it isn't a cup final because these people are taking shelter. And I must say, on the whole, they look pretty well satisfied about it. They've got the white line painted along the platform to keep them back from the passengers who have to board these trains because the service is maintained pretty regularly in spite of the tremendous number of shelters that the LPTB has to house every night now. Uh, they've got about eight feet of platform to sit down on and when they sit there they've got these great garish advertisements for beer and all sorts of different the train just going out now this is london calling in the overseas service of the british broadcasting corporation we shall broadcast on the third sunday of every month a service from St. Martin's in the Fields, London. St. Martin's has become known all over the world as the Empire Church through the work of Canon Dick Shepherd and his successor, the Reverend Pat McCormick. This morning, we take you to St. Martin's for the first of these special services for overseas listeners. The Reverend Pat McCormick will give the address. For those of you who have hymn books ready, I'd like to say that the hymns of this service are Through the Night of Doubt and Sorrow, Jesus, Lover of My Soul, and Eternal Father. And the theme of the service is union, our union with God and each other in the one family in Jesus Christ. We'll sing the hymn Through the Night of Doubt and Sorrow. In St. Martin's hymn book, Songs of Praise, 678, 678, in Ancient and Modern, 274, and in Church Hymnary, 214.
was evacuated with my brother's school. He was four years older. We went by train to Headcorn. And from Headcorn, we were taken to Tenterden in Kent, where we were farmed out. Went to a place called Rose Cottage. It was the first time that we ever saw workings of a farm. Rabbit shooting, catching rabbits. I even saw a calf being born, which was frightening. Uh, used to walk to school in Tenton itself. My father, who was uh, working at the Woolwich Arsenal in the um, ammunition factory there, he used to cycle down once a week to Tenton and to fetch his sweet ration for the kids. And cycle all the way back. Well, good evening, everybody, from the Palace, Manchester. I'm sure you're all delighted to welcome Mipmar back to the air. And the overture's just finishing. The show's shortly going to start. I shall have plenty of time to talk to you during the first part and tell you about the cast. I wish I had as many shillings. <laughs> well, folks, welcome to the office of twerps. No smoke or smell comes from the lamp as the fun goes round, and children in arms are not admitted unless with somebody. Well, enough of this tomfoolery, girls, and don't sail your china ducks in my top hat. Step on it, slaves. <laughs> Isn't that nice, eh? <laughs> <laughs> it was about 11 when the war broke out, actually. As I say, I remember having to tape all the windows up and for the bomb blast that they were expecting. But it was these evacuees that stick in my mind because, of course, they were my age group. Mainly they came from Manchester, which wasn't too far, but quite far enough safety-wise. I was in a little town called Timperley in Cheshire, actually, the nearest town being Altrincham. And they would come mainly from Manchester because they were getting very concentrated bombing attacks at that time. They would be brought by buses um, and coach loads, not so many cars, because there weren't many private cars in those days. Uh, they would have a few um, bus loads there, children and mothers inside the Churchill then all sat round on chairs with the little gas mask cases, you know, on the shoulders and little tags on the lapel with the names on. And they'd just be sat there. It was just like a cattle market, because they didn't know who they were going to live with. I think at any one time we'd have maybe, not more than say three at a time, but that included like my brother and I, and we had these two little boys, one's Bobby and Harold. Then their father came to visit them and asked if he could stay too. Because <laughs> everything really w was upturned and upset as far as sleeping arrangements go. I mean, we didn't always go to bed. We were sleeping downstairs, so you could fit more people sleeping downstairs because we'd bring the mattresses down and we'd put all the table up, all the leaves of the table, put the mattress under the table and you could have four or five kiddies sleeping heads and tails on mattresses under the table. One of the safest places to be was under the stairs in the pantry. We never went out to the shelters. They issued you with tabletop shelter, which was a big steel cage, and you'd put your own table away and you'd use that as your table for the duration, with your chenille cloth on the top and all that. A lovely big family thing, but each side was covered in like with cage door to keep you safe, and you would sleep under there at night. But of course, we utilised them in the daytime, you know, because they would such a good, strong top. And the church we used to go to, they did used to put on various shows and and pantomimes, and I used to be in the chorus with this other friend of mine, Hilda. And uh, we used to tap dance and toe dance and all that. So we'd say to her mum, when we've had tea, can we come and tap dance on the table, you know? So she'd say, mm, all right, you know, and she'd take the cover off. And I don't think we even played music, we'd just sing and hum and that, but we would be Fred Astaire and Ginger Rogers. Oh, by the way, did you uh, hear about the proud father who would talk about his little boy to everybody. One day he met a friend of his and said, 
I have a marvellous kid, you know. He's only four years old, knows everything, real chip of the old block. It's amazing the way he picks everything up, really. Well, only the other day we were going along the road, marvellous little kid, when we saw a train going over a viaduct. What do you think he said? A real chip of the old block. Look, Daddy. Puff, puff. And, uh, all right, right. And now George is going to make the next announcement. Incidentally, this is the first time, quite seriously, he's done so since we've been broadcasting. Well, Kaz, how did you like the Hobsons? The Hobsons' choice, voice? Well, of course, I thought so. Kenneth is going to give you a little monologue entitled, If We Play Up For The Side. So now it's the last wicket, you fellows. Our backs are right up to the wall, and we're facing some very fast bowling. But this wicket is not going to fall. We've got all our pads and our gloves on, and there's one thing that can't be denied. We'll crack every ball through the covers if we play up for the side. For a thousand years, chaps, our fine teamwork has got the applause from the stand. No invader has passed our defences, no umpire has lifted his hand. And now that they use all their cunning, and bodyline bowling is tried, they'll find we can hit to the boundaries if we play up for the side. We've kept up the scoring for centuries, we've always played a straight bat, and we don't mean to finish our innings, we'll never say out to house that. They can close in from every direction. They can mock, they can sneer and deride. But we'll knock them for six without question if we play up for the side. Yes, we used to have Hammond and Sutcliffe. Australia fought us in peace. But now all the empire is fighting and Churchill is there at the crease. So open your shoulders, you fellows. Let's take what may come in our stride, and we'll win. They can't take this wicket if we play up for the side. Diamonds for the nation. The generous gift of a magnificent diamond necklace, described as being of the most superb quality, has been made to the nation by an anonymous lady as a contribution to the cost of the war effort. By order of the Lords Commissioners of the Treasury, this necklace is being offered for sale by auction today at the great rooms of Christie's in London. We are taking you now to these sale rooms where the bidding is about to start. Well, just before the auctioneer, Mr. McKenna, mounts the rostrum, which incidentally is Chippendale and has been used here for over 150 years, let me just sketch for you the scene. We're in the great room at Christie's. The necklace itself rests glittering there in a case in the center of the room. It's one of the loveliest things you ever saw. Graduated diamonds up to the size of a sixpence, some 48 of them set in individual collets. And just to keep up the standard of brilliance, they're separated by smaller twin diamonds, which punctuate the rope like so many colons in a sentence. That's 141 diamonds in all. And this is almost a unique occasion here because uh, besides this necklace, only the Portland vase, I believe, has been considered worth a separate sale. And now this generous lady wants to see these diamonds turned into tanks, shells, aeroplanes, or anything that's going to help the national war. We had very little money. The clothes were rationed, food was rationed, and all we girls were immediately put on to war work if we were 18. We were directed to some kind of war work and we were given two or three choices either munitions or I happened to go into the civil service as a temporary civil servant and if you got tired of that kind of work you could go and take another job but it all had to be connected with war work you couldn't get anything much of anything during those six years we became used to not having much because everybody were in the same boat we uh, went into pubs of course but there was a rationing of beer and rationing of spirits and everything was in very, very short supply. And there may be maybe three or four nights during the, the week, there wasn't any beer at all in certain pubs. And then someone would say, there's been a delivery of beer at such a pub and we'd all dash to the pub to get a drink of beer. It wasn't uh, available all the time, like cigarettes weren't either. 
they were in short supply. Everything was in short supply. We girls didn't have any clothes much because the coupons that we had were very, very rationed. So if you got an outfit, it was a long time before you could afford the coupons for another one or even the money. I lived in Morecambe where there was very, very little industry. So the males there were not in reserved occupations. So they all went to war and a lot of them died. Particularly a boyfriend that I had who was um, on the hood, which he assured me they could never sink. It was impregnable. And on the 24th of May 1941, the Bismarck sank the hood with a loss of 1,500 lives. That was my darkest moment of the war when I lost my boyfriend, as many, many hundreds of my people that I knew it happened to as well, husbands, boyfriends, fathers. And it was a very, very sad time. One moment your life is going to be rosy and you have great plans and you're going to be married eventually and raise a family and in a split second all those hopes and dreams vanish and you have to readjust and it takes a long long time to get over the trauma of losing anybody that you're very much in love with and this is what happened to a lot of 18 and 19 year olds during the beginning and entirely the way right through the war come with me into one of the recruiting stations a young man registers, in due course he will have his medical examination and he then will begin to become a soldier and at that moment becomes a customer for the Minister of Supply to clothe and equip. It is your duty to yourself, to your neighbour and friends, to your city and your country, to guard your own home, business or factory from fire bombs. You cannot stop a high explosive bomb from bursting, but you can well stop a fire bomb. I say to all my listeners, do not wait for a job to look for you. Fit yourself to take a job in the country's armament industry. There are training facilities available in the government's training centers for the youths under 20, for men between 25 and 45, and also men between 20 and 25 who have been rejected for military Today service. We begin a new Dig for Victory campaign. The successful Dig for Victory campaign this autumn was one of the best answers to Hitler's attempt to damage our overseas food supplies and interrupt our communications. We must try and rope in every single person. All London motorists prepared to run a daily return service for parties in their neighbourhood could get enough extra petrol to do 200 miles a week. 200 miles is the limit but even that sounds like a beautiful dream to motorists uh, who've been waiting for favourable winds <laughs> and even then pushing their cars home at the end of the month. <laughs> the job of my ministry is to turn the wealth of the nation into bullets and shells and guns and tanks, to take the raw material of our great productive power and forge it into a sword of victory. I worked for a little while in my father's office. He was a solicitor in Glasgow. As some of the boys got called up and while I was waiting to be called up for training for the Land Army, which took place down at Ayr at Auchen Croove. And we all went down there and had four weeks of inverted commas training. They issued us with a uniform, which was dungarees and a drill jacket and a khaki color and Airtex type shirts and uh, boots and gum boots and our walking out uniform or our winter uniform whichever way you like to look at it was a pair of corduroy breeches which never fitted and a green pullover and we had a chocolate brown coloured top coat and a tie of course and a felt hat with the badge in the middle and the thing was to shape the hat into all sorts of quirky ways one bit up one bit down and so forth not what a sergeant major would have thought was the way to behave but we hadn't any of those so we were okay one group had the first week in the bar learning to milk cows and feed cattle and so on the second lot were on pigs and poultry a third lot were out in the fields and the fourth lot were learning to drive a tractor and work with implements we were 
volunteers because we were young and we were able to choose what service we wanted to go into. It was very funny because some of the girls were conscripted girls and they had been hairdressers in air or in shops and so forth and some of them didn't know the backside of a cow from the front and it was very hard for them and they would get up at four in the morning, wash in cold water, put on their eye makeup and their lipstick and off down to the buyers to milk the cows. Well, <laughs> the cows didn't appreciate it very much and they realised that the weather wasn't going to do their makeup much good so they managed to put that aside after a while. There and a lot of them stayed on and married farmers and stayed in the country. The men hadn't all been called up from the farms and we really weren't required right away. It was just as the call up took place and as the men went off, then the farmers found they needed somebody. So after a bit, uh, I was fortunate in finding another farm up in Aberfeldy. It had been a sheep farm and it was up on a hill and very steep and not the kind of land that would normally have been ploughed up. But because of the war and the need to produce food and save shipping, feed the animals, lots of fields were ploughed up that never had been ploughed up before. And it was really quite dicey because they were so steep. And we had pigs, we had poultry, and occasionally we had sheep, but they came from other farms and spent the summer months with us and then went back for the winter to their own places. And they were a perfect nuisance because the fences weren't too good and they were always getting out. And as soon as we came in tired and washed and sat down to our evening meal, somebody would shout that the sheep were out on the road or the sheep were out in somebody else's field or the sheep were in the kale or something and we had to set out and sort them out. So we were quite pleased when they went home to their own owners. The farmer tried to get the estate to mend these fences the whole time I was there but the excuse was, don't you know there's a war on? Bandwagon, come on and make a trip upon the bandwagon It's a wild voice, it's a grand voice, it's a wild voice Wish we could find a new way of starting this show besides you saying that. No, stop it, Big. We had all that out last week. Yes, but you must admit it gets a bit umdrum. Aye, proper umdrum. Aye, it's really umdrum. We had that out last week too, yeah. didn't we? Well, let's tell him the joke about old Nasty's father and mother. No, the censor had that, that out this morning. Uh, if I remember right, Leo. Oh, yes. In any case, Big, remember what we agreed. We were going to give old Nasty a rest this week and talk about something else for a change. Yes, but you feel you'd like to say something about him. You know, he's pinched a lot of our publicity, mm. hasn't he? <laughs> I mean, he's had his name in the paper every day this week. <laughs> anyway, Mrs. Bagwash isn't worried about him. Oh, she doesn't care a hoot. She said to me this morning, it's no good them Germans sitting up in those balloons over London trying to frighten us because they can't. <laughs> By the way, Big, who was the gentleman who came to the flat just as we were coming down to broadcast? Oh, that was the gentleman from the town hall. He said he called for the form that he left last Tuesday. What form? Well, the application form for the international refrigeration thing. Well, you mean the <laughs> national registration? That's right. Did you give it to him? Oh, no, I told him he didn't want to join. No, you <laughs> silly little man. <laughs> We've got to fill that in. Why? Well, if we don't, we'll be liable to a penalty. You know what a penalty is, don't yes, you? Yes, it's when a member of one side kicks his own behind. Oh, is that right? <laughs> I was 14 when war broke out. I'd started work at the local corset factory. They were comprised of uh, steel bands and to uh, reinforce the garment to keep the figure intact. And you had to acquire the art of stitching around each steel, which was a very, very hard job. And many a time the needle would go through your finger when you were trying to get the stitches close to the steel. I hated it and I was quite glad when um, I was told I got to go into munitions. I did night shift and I worked with a mate 
and both between you put rivets in the plane and some nights I used to get so tired I used to sit in the toilet sit in the factory and fall asleep you know where I felt so exhausted there was a very good comradeship amongst all the girls and the fellas naturally there was a few on going romances but the limelight of the thing for me was when the canteen concert started and I sang on the stage one of the songs I sang was this is the army Mr. Jones hello forces we present your top of the bill number 13 <laughs> This week's top of the bill is Hermione Badley, star of The Little Reviews. John Pritchard accompanies her at the piano. Hello, forces. Now, this evening, I'm starting with a song called Hotel Piece. I've especially been asked to do this for the boys, but our beloved Florence Desmond imitated me doing this the other day and did it so well that I hardly feel I must ever do it again. But anyway, here goes. Love walked right in and drove my shadows away. Love walked right in and brought my happiest day. Aggie, Aggie, have you emptied Mrs. Brown's uh, hot water bottle? Oh, that's a good girl. As manageress of the Talbot Arms, I try to keep the tune up. With a smile that cheers and a voice that charms our visitors when they phone up. A very good class we cater for in tweeds and aquas cuter that don't disgrace our antlers or our sporting prince or pewter. My coiffure cannot fail to pass, my spray is picturesque, my nails are nice and I keep a glass of stout behind the desk. It's true our guests may sometimes fail to tip the under porter. Our chambermaids could tell a tale or two about hot water. We sometimes find a lady's comb in a bedroom that surprises. But there, to make a home from home, it takes all sorts and sizes. It takes all sorts and sizes. In the village where I lived, a consignment of American GIs were billeted in the field. And they all started to amalgamate at the local pub, which is called The Anchor. And they all drank whiskey. First of all, the locals were suspicious of them. A lot of the old locals, you know, in their 60s, 70s. But then after a while, they all started being friendly and they were very, very outgoing with their money. And the village girls started to swoon over them because as far as we were concerned, the only American voices we'd ever heard was at the local cinema, Saturday morning, Tuckney Rush. We used to watch Janet MacDonald, Nelson Eddy, Humphrey Bogart. And to us, this was like film stars real film stars, you know, come into our lives, like the real McCoy, the way they talked and uh, they had a way of charming you, you know, and there was one, especially one American, he'd eat outside the village pub and he'd play a guitar and he'd play it lovely. His name was um, Sonny and he used to sing that song, just like a cowboy, You Are My Sunshine. We had some lovely times that I did go out with them and I found them to be gentlemen. There was one, he was a sergeant. Well, he was really handsome, that one. And uh, he took me to see a friend of his because French A Hospital near Bristol was the hospital for GIs while they were here. Uh, mainly venera diseases, I think. And we walked through these lovely leafy country lanes and I can always remember catching all his hand and I felt terribly guilty because actually he was the boyfriend of my best friend. <laughs> Personally, I found they weren't as forward as Englishmen. And they would take no for an answer because those days we were frightened, frightened of having babies, you know, there was no preventive measures then. You just had to say no, you know, and they didn't press you. But uh, I must say that they did lose interest in you if you didn't uh, go along with their suggestions. Well, they take you to their dances, to barrack dances where money was no object. And that was where I first learnt to uh, jitterbug. The um, GIs were very mystified by the laid-back country life. They hadn't seen anything like it. It was such a small village and 
everybody knew everybody else but then after a time they seem to amalgamate and they enhance the uh, friendship in the village if anything the only people that really didn't take to him was the boyfriends and the husbands seven years ago i wrote a book called english journey which appeared in many different countries and attracted a good deal of attention it was as i said on the title page a rambling but truthful account of what one man saw and heard and felt and thought during a journey through England in the year 1933. Some of the places I visited then I haven't seen since, and I've been wondering, as I expect some of you have been wondering, what conditions are like now that we're in the middle of another war. Are they better? Are they worse? I don't know and I want to know. So tonight we're going to some of these places to hear for ourselves. Now one of the first cities I visited in 1933, and one that took my fancy, was Bristol. Now what's happening in Bristol these days? I imagine it's changed a good deal. Yes, Bristol has changed these last few years. The town centre is being rebuilt one no longer finds the bowsprits of the ships mixed up so thoroughly with the traffic as a few years ago. Parts of the harbour, in fact, have been filled in. And since the war, some 30 or 40,000 people have moved into the Bristol area. But if the things they talk about are different, people in the Bristol wine shops and bars are still very much the same. And so is their Bristol speech. I worked as a projectionist in uh, Waterloo Station. A little cinema on the side. It was specifically for passengers and we used to put on uh, Three Stooges, Pete Smith specialties, March of Time, the latest news. But we used to finish uh, about nine o'clock in the evening then because people used to want to get home. I then joined the LDV. Since the war began, the government have received countless inquiries from all over the kingdom from men of all ages who are, for one reason or another, not at present engaged in military service, and who wish to do something for the defence of their country. Well, now is your opportunity. We want large numbers of such men in Great Britain who are British subjects between the ages, ages of 17 and 65, 17 and 65, to come forward now and offer their service in order to make assurance doubly sure. The name of the new force, which is now to be raised, will be the Local Defence Volunteers. Local Defence Volunteers. This name describes its duties in three words. It must be understood that this is, so to speak, a spare time job, so there will be no need for any volunteer to abandon his present occupation. They gave me a, a thin khaki uniform, a forage cap and a, an armband with LDV on it. Oh, I was to bee's knees, wasn't I? <laughs> but no rifle. But eventually, um, a sergeant from the regular army came along and uh, he said, you're going to get rifles soon. And about two weeks later, we had uh, a few First World War rifles come through and uh, he took us down to the an archway underneath the railway station and got some ammo and we was banging away at targets and I remember him he used to say now to aim a rifle you keep the tip of the foresight in line with and the center of the shoulders of the dew of the backside sights thus aligned focus the mark and don't pull just squeeze <laughs> again from David Miller. Is everybody listening? It's time for 40 minutes with the BBC Dancing Club. Each week at this hour, Victor Sylvester will give a 10 minute dancing lesson for all listeners who wish to learn to dance. Followed by half an hour's dance music by his ballroom orchestra. I used to go dancing at Hammersmith Pally, Covent Garden, 
because that was made into a dance hall during the war. Uh, the Royal at Tottenham, where you could dance to Joe Lost for six months at a time. Uh, as young as we were, we used to go along to the local pubs underage, but they didn't mind, and they was often out of beer anyway, so we couldn't drink. I want, on behalf of us all, to thank you for your really magnificent reception. We are very, very grateful to you. Then, I want to thank with all my heart Faye Compton, Kay Hammond, Margaret Rutherford, Cecil Parker, and the rest of the cast for their brilliant performances. It feels strange and very, very comforting after having traveled over 40,000 miles to be back in Manchester again, standing on a stage and experiencing the same thrill that I had 21 years ago when my first play was produced in this city for the first time at the dear old Gay. <laughs> Much has happened to all of us since then. We've grown up, we've grown older, some of us have even grown wiser. I have at least grown wise enough to know that in spite of the exigencies of war, my truest happiness is now, and always will be, to feel that something I have written or composed or acted has given you pleasure. You see, I've been away from the theatre during these last two difficult years, and I've missed it very sadly. I wrote this play entirely from selfish motives. Not to cheer you up, because the English people don't need cheering up. But to recapture for myself the personal satisfaction of being home again, however briefly. It's a special occasion because it proves that in spite of our being an island fortress, in spite of blitzes and discomforts and inconveniences and alarms, the English theatre can still function our actors can still play lightly and gaily, and our audiences can still laugh and applaud and enjoy themselves. And I would like to say in conclusion how proud I am to have been able to make even the small contribution of this play towards the united determination of this country to get on with the job, whatever it is. We did sometimes have a laugh about the rationing, trying to make do with things, dried egg and Dad used to know somebody that I think underneath was in the black market and he used to get us meat, which I found out after was horse meat. With the dried egg, you know, we used to try and make cakes with it and they used to come out ever so dry. And then when we couldn't get currants, Dad had a black currant bush in the garden and Mum used to make rock cakes and she used to cut the currants up, the black currants in the cakes, you know. And when you ended up eating a cake, it was full of this horrible red gooey juice. <laughs> there was no way you could stretch your rations. What we did used to do, there was some quite a few farms around, you know, and they used to grow Swedes. We might go and confiscate a few Swedes, jump over the wall at night and pinch in apples and things like that. In the local pub, you could always seem to get an extra quarter of tea or different things, a bit of margarine and that sort of thing. My father kept rabbits and chickens and we ate those. The rabbit pelts were used. My mother made moccasins and fur mittens from the pelts and I remember the pelts hanging up to dry before they were sent off to be cured. My mother would never eat the meat but as children we didn't seem to mind the fact that that was what was happening. My father kept chickens and the eggs were collected and some were sold to neighbours. The eggs were wrapped in a, a square of newspaper um, which was rolled over the egg from the corner and folded in at the sides and then put in a paper bag so that they didn't break. I don't particularly remember having many sweets but they were wrapped in a cone-shaped pack which was made of a, a square of paper wrapped around the shopkeeper's hand and formed into a cone and the bottom was folded up so the sweets didn't fall through. Good morning everybody. One or two rather interesting letters have turned up during the week and I'd like to deal with these now. Now let's take Birmingham first. A woman who's working in a factory there writes that she's no time to shop during the day 
and most of the shops are shut by the time she's through, or else the things she wants have disappeared. Well, it's a problem, I know. But I saw one very useful story in one of the newspapers which puts forward a good suggestion. Here's the cutting. When a woman war worker complains that she has no time to do her shopping, you make sympathetic noises, no doubt. But in Hounslow, they cry, Oh, don't you know? Phone up Mrs. Brown. Hounslow, such and such a number. For Mrs. Brown, being local WVS leader, has a squad of 30 cycling volunteers who will do the shopping and find the ration books in the top left dresser drawer, if necessary, and deliver it to you. More than 50 housewife war workers already get Mrs. Brown's shopping girls to do their shopping every week. And, said Mrs. Brown yesterday, we get new clients every day. It's all free. Now, there you are, there's an idea. Why not start one in your own part of the country? After the first bomb had hit Somerset House, the probate registry went to London, no. And then I was transferred to the divorce registry, which stayed in London. They didn't normally have young ladies dealing with divorce cases and even during the wartime there were certain files that were marked with a red label and the girls knew that they shouldn't really look at them. There were raids night and day of course and actually I was on first aid, I wasn't a warden. And when the sirens went we ushered all the people downstairs where there were beautiful shelters and I then went into the first aid room, got the steriliser going and just waited to see what would happen. Mixing in with all kinds of ranks down on ARP, right from the establishment officer who was a registrar down to the lowest of the low in the clerical staff, that broadened my vision tremendously. And when we were downstairs, we were Christian names only and had to remember when we went back upstairs office hours to call our friend Sir the thing that disrupted us most was a bomb that didn't go off which landed through the basement into what was the kitchen and it was there for two or three days so of course apart from the ARP staff nobody was allowed in and we had to stay there and remove the wills and any documents that were of great value and when it eventually was diffused this was rather marvellous because there was a little note in it which said that it was from our friends in Czechoslovakia and it was full of sand. So it wouldn't have done any damage anyway, but we thought they were so brave. The night that the city was blitzed, I really thought that I would die and uh, it was really very frightening. Somerset House had a tank of water underneath the square which none of us realised and that saved us from burning because there were incendiaries all over the place and as fast as the men were putting them out, more came. I suppose we were all attuned to the fact that we might be killed, but my only horror was that I might be buried and I, I couldn't, well, I would have had to efface it, but that was my fear. I didn't mind so much if it was a direct hit and we were all killed. I would have hated to have been buried as some of the poor people were. The other day, President Roosevelt gave his opponent in the late presidential election a letter of introduction to me. And in it he wrote out a verse in his own, in his own handwriting uh, from Longfellow, which he said applies to you people as it does to us. Here is the verse. Sail on, O ship of state. Sail on, O union, strong and great. Humanity, with all its fears, with all the hopes of future years, is hanging breathless on thy fate. What is the answer that I shall give in your name to this great man, the thrice-chosen head of a nation of 130 million? Here is the answer which I will give to President Roosevelt. Put your confidence in us. Give us your faith and your blessing. And under providence, all will be well. We shall not fail or falter. We shall not weaken or tire. Neither the sudden shock of battle nor the long-drawn trials of vigilance and exertion will wear us down. Give us the tools and we will finish the job. I told my father I wanted to join the ATS. 
because my brother was already in the Navy, so I thought I'd do my bit. But he put his foot down, he wouldn't allow me to go. They were building an arsenal, you know, the munitions factory in Bridgend at the time. Well, it was just about completed. And when it was, I applied for a job and had a job then, stay there all through the war. I found it very hard, really. It was 12 hour shifts and no, no time off at all. A fortnight of 12 hour shifts, night shift. Then we had one night off and then we had a fortnight day shift. 12 hours making detonators and we'd start work at 10 o'clock and then somebody would start singing and in the end they'd all join in. We used to sing all the songs that were popular then, you know, hymns and all sorts. <laughs> we'd sing for hours until break time then we'd stop for a cup of tea and food. We had to go to an ablution room where we used to have to wash ourselves, you know, hands and that before we went over the other, what they call the clean side of the barrier. Then we could go to the canteen and have tea and sandwiches. This is so we wouldn't contaminate anything, you know, with the powder. I could remember lunchtime that they'd have the radio on in the big dining place and it would be workers' playtime or um, music while you work, that was it. A lot of people would burst into song then. Go as you please, people would get up and do a little turn, you know, sing a song, mostly sentimental songs, you know. There was a lovely atmosphere at work. Good luck, war workers. Well, I'd only been working, I think, a couple of nights and there was this air raid warning. We all had to troop out in the dark where they'd built air raid shelters on the emissions factory. I mean, if they'd bombed the factory, we'd have all been blown up. But it would have protected us from shrapnel. We used to sit there all night long because they wouldn't allow us to go back in because um, it was too dangerous. So inside the shelter, it was made of brick. It was something like a bus, rows of seats like that with an aisle in the centre and it'd be full up of us girls and we'd sing all night. Hymns, war songs, love songs, funny songs. My Brother Sylvester was one song that everybody used to like. I used to sing it for them, you know. We all used to get up and do a little turn in the shell. You could hardly see each other because the light was so bad, so I didn't mind getting up and doing it. When I worked on the um, high explosive, it, it, there was a yellow powder and we had to keep our hair covered because they told us it would go yellow. Mine did go yellow all in the front. My hands went yellow, my face went yellow. My hair was fairly long, but we used to tie um, an old stocking around your head and tuck the hair all round it. It was called a victory roll because we couldn't use anything metal at work because it could cause a spark. And no suspenders or anything with metal on, nothing at all. We were supposed to wear garters. When I went on this particular job on mercury detonators, we used to get danger money because if one thing blew up, it would have killed us all. Sometimes I used to think about, we were making things to kill people, you know, I did. And I didn't feel very happy about that. Killing other men, I mean, they might have been Germans or whatever, but uh, we were killing some mother's son, weren't we? But people used to say, well, the boys need it. Come on, let's get on with it. Thank you. 
Today, September the 3rd, as listeners will remember... Listeners do remember. You needn't remind us that this war's been on four years. This program of yours may tell us things we know or things we don't know. But for every one of us listeners, and please remember this, this is our war too. These four years were ours. A war doesn't consist only of headlines. It consists of the lives and deaths of ordinary people. Ask yourself this question when your fire is bright. Is it really necessary? Am I doing right? Think about your target. Think about your goal. Is it really necessary? I was a teenager. I lived in Manchester with my mother and three sisters. When you used to see soldiers and sailors in the streets, suddenly you realised, you know, that, that there was a war and there was no air raids or anything like that. In a way it was exciting, in another way it wasn't because everywhere that you went you saw queues, food and things started disappearing from the shelves in the shops. Clothes rationing was introduced and somebody would come in and say, you know, got some coupons to spare and uh, you'd look and see if you had enough and you'd, you'd buy them even though it was illegal, you'd buy them. My mother used to keep the coupons. We used to give my mother the whole of the um, wage packet then she would allow us spends. And that's all we had, so obviously we could never ever buy clothes with the spends. I was at the age then, 15, when um, clothes were starting to um, be a thing that I wanted to wear. Stockings were the, the worst thing. With having three sisters, it was first at best dressed. <laughs> um, makeup I didn't use then because my mother didn't approve of it. I think she thought it looked a bit tarty. I didn't wear makeup at home. I used to go to work and put makeup on. And when I'd finished work, I used to scrub my face clean. So my mother wouldn't know I'd been using makeup. To listeners at home and overseas, and also via the Blue Network Company to listeners in the United States, the British Broadcasting Corporation presents, through the courtesy of the Special Service Division of the United States Army, a half hour of highlights from the Irving Berlin's famous show, This is the Army, which is now touring Britain in aid of British service charities. The programme is played by Irving Berlin and his great cast of American soldiers and is produced by James Dillenforth and introduced by John Watt. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Well, this Irving Berlin show, This is the Army, is now taking London by storm and next week it starts to take a lot of provincial cities by storm. Next week, Glasgow. Uh, as a great many of you won't be able to get into the theatre to see this show, we thought we might like to give you an opportunity of hearing some of the tunes from it. Every member of the cast, a hundred or so of them, uh, is a serving soldier in the American Army, except Irving Berlin himself, who was a serving soldier in the American Army in the last war. Well, we probably shan't be able, in half an hour of radio, to give you a complete idea of the pace and glitter and movement of the thing, but, and we certainly shan't be able to show you much of the dancing. But uh, now for the show itself. From the opening chorus, the curtain goes up, on the entire company, ranged up on platforms from the footlights up to the backcloth, all in service uniform, a soldier chorus and orchestra of 80 men, and with military precision they go into... Ready, aim, <coughs> fire! If we go to the pictures and the dancing, they'd walk me home and uh, I'd um, walk them to the end of our street. We used to all go around in the crowd. If anyone was going dancing, they'd say, right, we're going to such a place, and they'd say, right. And this night, one of the girls said, oh, we're all going to Bellevue tonight. So I said, right, and we all got ready. And when we got there, it was old time dancing. It was when the Americans were over and they started the jitterbug and there was big notices all around Bellevue, no jitterbugging. Well, I couldn't jitterbug anyway. So I was just stood leaning against the um, pillow and suddenly I heard this voice in my ear and said, gee, and I always thought sugar was rationed. Well, I just turned round and this American I started from his shoes and looked up and gave him a withering look and when I looked at him he was the image of Joseph Cotton who was my favourite and we just started laughing 
he bought me a drink, lemonade, and uh, he walked home with me. And we met quite a few times. And then I went to meet him one night and he wasn't there. So I just thought, oh, that, that's it. And then I got a letter from him from France and he was saying he was in a foxhole and uh, he was sorry about uh, missing me and um, he wrote quite a few times and then suddenly they all stopped and I think it was about the time of the second front so I think he must have been killed but he was a, a very very nice boy he was the first and the only American I ever ever went with for many years, I've been coming to England as a visitor, staying sometimes for several months. This time, I've spent a little more than a fortnight. But in that time, I've seen more of the heart and soul of Britain than I've ever been privileged to see in all my past visits. England has changed. In the cities, some of the skylines have been altered. The tourists have changed too, from mufti to uniform. They're not here now to see Westminster Abbey, but to help preserve it. You may wonder why a movie actor chooses to speak to you about faces in this solemn tone. My excuse is that I have been exhibiting my face to the peoples of this and many lands for more years than I care to remember. Now the roles are reversed. My world of make-believe is darkened. I sit in my seat and watch the great screen across which move the people to whom I once played. I have been watching a 14 real picture entitled Britain Marches to Victory. And now I'm writing a fan letter. It all started at the time when I was trying to raise money for a Spitfire fund. I've lived for seven years out in East Africa. That is more than half my life. In fact, my father's out in Palestine now. I've got quite a lot of interesting things that we've brought back from there. So I held an exhibition of them in the tent in our garden and charged people penny or twopence to come in. Then a man who kept poultry promised me a dozen eggs and I raffled them at sixpence a time. Altogether in this and in other ways, I raised four pounds ten. Everybody used to try and do their bit for the war effort. The um, merchant navy used to issue cards which had a merchant seaman on them divided into little squares and each square was worth a penny and every time you collected a penny you filled in a square and when you'd filled up the whole card which was probably four or five pounds worth you then sent it off to the merchant navy and they did whatever they wanted to do with it and during term time when we had time we'd make little things to sell um, pin cushions pot holders brooches out of beads and we always used to dress a doll and name the doll. And we'd take a little table, it was a little card table, take it down to the bottom of the road in the school holidays, set this up with all our little bits and pieces on. It was surprising the number of neighbours and people going out to do their shopping. I'd spend a penny on a pot holder or whatever, or guess the doll's name and that sort of thing. And we, we filled in quite a few cards and sent off our four and five pounds to the Merchant Navy. When the air raid siren went, we just used to gather it all up and run home again. <laughs> I cannot eat but little meat. My stomach is not good. No, no, that's not a confession. It's a poet's description of a pre-war boxing day. Really pre-war, for he wrote it 400 years ago. But how are you today? How's your tongue? Is it smooth and red or knobby and beige with an overcoat of a muddy hue? And how's the stomach? Is it firm and steady or somewhat warm or a little wobbly and a trifle windy? Or was your Christmas day so spartan that today you're fighting fit with no twinge of remorse? Well, a word on digestion. It's the preparing of food for its absorption into the body. But nature has so arranged our digestions that we know not what they're doing. We're kept in blissful ignorance of stomach movements, of gastric juices, of pepsin and renin and all the paraphernalia of digestive ferments. As Mark Twain put it, part of the secret of success in this life is to eat what you like and let the food fight it out inside. Well, that's only half the truth, but there's something in it. Indigestion is knowledge and unwanted knowledge of what is going on inside. My mother was ingenious with the way they used to make the rations go around a whole family. A couple of ounces of sugar and butter and that sort of thing. 
my father kept chickens and rabbits in the garden and so we had eggs and meat and he had an allotment so we always had plenty of fresh vegetables my sister and I used to help him on the allotment and if my mother got a glut of eggs they went into the icing glass they didn't taste all that good when they came out but I mean they were a, a means to an end I mean sugar was rationed but syrup wasn't every week without fail we had to have a syrup tart and I don't like syrup but then Things like bananas, occasionally the greengrocer would get some in. And it was amazing how the word went round, we didn't have telephones, that Mrs Barrel was her name, up the road had got apples or oranges and all us kids used to be sent up there to go and get what we could get, you know. Or we had a very good local market, the High Street in Walthamstow. And... We used to go down there with mum and if any of the greengrocer's stalls had anything unusual we used to have to get behind my mother in the queue and we didn't dare call her mum, we weren't even with her. <laughs> She'd give us <laughs> a few pence, get whatever you can, it might be a pound of apples or a couple of oranges. My mother had a larder, she had no refrigeration at all, heaven knows how she used to keep things. She used to keep the milk in the very hot weather in a bucket of water just to keep it cool. And in the winter, she put it in the larder window where you, you'd have a cold wind blasting it, so that kept it. But all these things, there was no refrigeration. There was no washing machine. I, I used to dread Mondays coming home from school when I was six or seven because she'd been scrubbing all day. She had an old gas boiler. The place used to be filled with steam and droplets of water everywhere. And then she used to ring it with an old ringer. The washing would be pulled through with an old ringer. And if it was raining, uh, she had one of these things, I don't know what you call it, in the kitchen. It was like four long bars of wood which were held by pieces of rope. And she'd sling the washing over there and, and it was always damp. I hated Mondays and there was always a smell of polish because when she'd finished work, she polished the floor. Here's another old friend who's been brightening the ether for a long time now, the Punctuation King, Stainless Stephen. <laughs> Welcome to Music Hall, said he, bowing with difficulty, owing to arm at torso. <laughs> <laughs> this is Britain's glamour boy comma, the voice of the man, semi-frantic, fameless Stephen. Yes, boys, I'm wearing my invasion suit today. <laughs> Some of you may have seen the film Gone with the Wind. I'm different. I came down here with a wind up. <laughs> Still, there's no reason I should be so nervous. I've never had such a warm reception in my life as I got down here this week. <clears throat> Loud laughter to those in the know. Now, Mr. Herbert Morrison, he says to us, don't panic, stand firm. Don't worry, Herbert. The only thing that would cause the British public to panic would be the news that the Germans were dropping cheese and onion sandwiches from the air. The milk of coconut and uh, 200 acre farm there. Well, it was just horses and that we were working with then. It was about 30 acre that we had to plow out for food and that we had to grow potatoes and wheat and all that. But all this wheat that was grown on the farm, the government had to have it, we couldn't use it. So, you're working longer hours, and like there was less men to get to do the jobs and that, therefore you had to work like, you know, a long time for no extra pay, there was no extra pay or nothing. Aye, that was Carmarthen singing my song for you, and this is Billy Welcome. Aye, Billy Welcome's come to Wales, all right. You know, t'other week out up in my own county, Yorkshire, looking for work. 
but there were no there, at least ways, no I could fancy it were all too hard. I, you know, it's about the same down here. Country folk and country work are much the same everywhere. But if I didn't find work, I'd a grand time looking for it in this rich valley. Rich in beauty, rich in wealth of soil, aye, and rich in people. Quite a lot of bartering went on in our own village. We had goats, and when they kidded, we would run a billy goat on till it was about six months old. This was when rationing had come in. And then the local butcher who provided the meat pies for the services club would butcher the goat. And we were very popular with all our friends then. And we also grew quite a lot of fruit and strawberries and things like that. And then in the winter, the farmers would kill a pig and we would get a bit back from that. There was no money ever went backwards and forwards at all. I think every farmer was allowed to kill a pig and goats weren't recognised as animals, so we were allowed to kill our billy goats and uh, very nice they were too. And then um, down at the big estate at Studley, there were deer and from time to time, odd deer would escape and come up into the fields and had to be killed. And when that happened, our butcher in Ripon used to provide venison pasties. The first question, um, which I'm putting myself, um, because um, it's rather a pleasure to do that occasionally, is, uh, and I think it's, it'll probably interest you uh, in a helpful way, what is the easiest kind of food to produce in 1943? Mr. Reese, perhaps you will start us off. <laughs> I'm rather at a disadvantage here in talking about the ease of producing food by keeping hens. On the rabbit side, I should like to say a word about meat. You know, we can't have poultry meat. We don't want cockerels reared for meat. But if you want to produce meat at home, the rabbit does give you a very excellent opportunity of producing something quite as good. It can be reared on waste. A very small amount of concentrated food needed only for the dough. The rest of it is waste. I should like to emphasize the part that the rabbit can play in providing protein, particularly for growing youngsters. Oh, that's the case for the rabbit. Well, so much for those whom the law permits and those whom it forbids to marry. And assuming that there is no cause or just impediment why marriage between two parties shouldn't take place, the next thing to decide is what kind of ceremony they want. And the choice lies between civil marriage, which has no religious ceremony of any kind, and marriage according to the rites or customs of whatever religion or denomination we belong to. A superintendent registrar told me yesterday that he's met people who think that a register office marriage is for only seven years. Good gracious me, we, we can't get married on a seven years lease. Civil marriage in a register office is just as legal and every bit as binding as marriage in church. Well, having decided whether it's to be a register office marriage or in a place of worship, the next thing to settle is when it's to be and where. And here we may be in a quandary because of separation or of uncertainty of getting leave, or in a hurry because of the likelihood of going overseas, or there may be some other difficulty. Now, some relaxations have been made to meet war conditions, particularly for members of the forces. Mind you, it's nothing really fundamental. Uh, for instance, there's no such thing as marriage by proxy in this country. The law still requires us to be present at our own wedding. I got engaged in 1940 because during the war, everybody was getting married. Everybody was frightened what the future was for them, but I didn't marry for quite a while after that. I embroidered all my tablecloths and all my bottom drawer down the cellar in 10 Parliament Hill in Hampstead. My sister-in-law had had a very large wedding before the war at the Wardoff Hotel. We went to the Wardoff but we didn't have a lot of wonderful things to eat because it just wasn't around. But we had a very nice reception there was odds and ends on toast, and my mother-in-law poo-pooed it almost. She said, oh dear, what's this? But you know, I definitely remember having champagne, because when we got the bill in, we were really quite surprised how much it had cost, because I hadn't asked to have champagne at all. We did have a proper wedding cake, and it wasn't a cardboard one. It was definitely a wedding cake, from the express dairy, that was. So 
I had a pale blue two-piece suit, dress and jacket. My mother obviously gave me all the coupons and I did get my hat from D.H. Evans and booked a room in the Waldorf Hotel. So I got changed in there. And then we went off on our honeymoon in Nosor, near Staffordshire. And as we were going along, the siren went off and we all had to delve into the shelter at Waterloo Station. And we stayed there all night and went up in the milk float in the morning time. And my friends had got fish and chips, which they'd managed to get hold of for our supper the night before. And of course, I had to throw them away. We had lots of um, air raids. And um, the night before I was married, we had a tremendous amount of funny little fire bombs. Um, we lined up all the empty ones all the way down where I had to walk when I got married. My husband's pilot in Coast Command and, and, and made the decision to have a child as soon as possible. Um, before I was 22, I was both a widow and then a mother. My husband was killed in May and she was born in October, so he was killed some months before. And um, I was waiting for Penny and my mother came down from Essex to be with me, which was quite an effort on Mummy's part because she didn't normally go anywhere. And we were walking along the beach for my daily walk for the good of my health at Kingsbridge. And there isn't really a beach, it's a sort of estuary. We were walking along the estuary and the tide was out and we saw these planes coming in quite low, only two of them. And we didn't think much of them because in Essex you really had had planes of every sort, every other moment. So as they came up the beach, they were very low. And then they fired, they machine gunned all along the beach in front of us. And it was the first time I'd actually seen the sand spit up. It really was very, well, exciting, I suppose. This thing came in and it's, one came in and then the other came in and we stood like dummies, I think, for a moment. And I said to my mother, whom I always called Mummy, I think we should take cover Mother, I remember that. And uh, there wasn't much cover to take. We ran up to the side of the estuary and lay under little scrubby trees, very embarrassed. It's the typically English of me not knowing quite what to say. Um, they, because when we walked home, my aunt was in absolute panic because they, um, well, the town had been bombed. She didn't know where we were. And Penny started that night, was born the next day. When they had the doodle bugs, I had David in the pram and my neighbour next door had a little girl named Carol and every five minutes she'd be saying, there's another one coming, there's another one coming and we would rush indoors with the prams because we were trying to keep the children outside to give them a bit of nice fresh air. But we seemed to feed David on spinach and eggs actually and my mother used to queue up in the market to get the pound of spinach to bring up to me and she lived in Hampstead and there was only the buses, no cars were allowed. And uh, when you were having a baby, they gave you double coupons to get your layette. And that was quite an effort to gather all the bits and pieces together. When my mother managed to get me a little totty pot from down in the market. And uh, how very, very thrilled we were with this little potty. They probably had half a dozen and you were lucky if you got one. Hello, children. I would like to say just once how glad I am, how very glad I am, to be back in the children's hour again, and to thank you, Mac, for inviting me to take part once more. It's been nearly four months, is not it, since I talked to you, and a great deal has happened in the world in that time. Many terrible things, but many good and encouraging things, too, for the Allies, and both you at home and the Americans over here have good grounds for being cheerful and looking ahead, hopefully, to the future. We had ration books issued. My brother, he was only a few months old when war broke out, and he had a green ration book because he was under five. I had a blue, and my parents were beige. We all had identity cards and gas masks. My brother had a great big black incubator, which the baby actually went inside and there was some sort of concertina pump thing at the side which my mother had to press to give fresh air to the baby. And then mine was just a little rubber thing that you put over your head and nose and mouth. And my parents had the same sort of contraption, only larger. 
I was the eldest, then my brother, he was born in April 39, and then my sister, she was born in the latter part of the war, February 44. There was a raid on, and my mother was in labour, and they had a bed set up for her downstairs in the living room. And it was up on bricks to make it fairly high for the midwife to be able to attend to her easily. My brother and I were upstairs in bed, and we heard a baby cry and my sister Vivian was born and we trooped down the stairs and we had some soft toy bunny rabbits that someone had knitted out of scraps of wool, highly coloured. <laughs> we were loading them onto this newborn baby which was a bit silly really. It was getting a bit noisy so we all had to get under mum's bed with the baby all wrapped up until the all clear was sounded. One of the most important jobs of work, both during and after an air raid, is prompt medical and surgical attention for the victims. A thing we hear a good deal of over here these days in this connection is blood transfusion, that miracle of healing that breathes new life into shattered bodies. Right throughout Britain, hundreds of thousands of men and women are giving their blood daily so that it may be treated and stored against the event of a raid or to save the life of some soldier, sailor or airman for well, these civilian donors also give their blood for the armed forces. Now, every Saturday, we send forces serving in isolated parts their own program. It's all yours. From this program, we now send you forces wherever you may be, a message in song, and in particular to Gunnar Rees in Iraq. Here's your niece, 10-year-old Petula Clark, one of the sweetest children you ever saw, to sing you Mighty Like a Rose. 